We hear it all the time. Don't leave anyone behind. Don't go out alone. Be careful. But sometimes the boredom can lead to throwing caution to the wind and unwinding with a night out on the town. For one gorgeous model, the risk was way greater than she could have ever anticipated. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, it's nice to finally meet you. So today, I'll be introducing you to Christina Carlin Kraft. It was the early morning hours in the summer of 2018 when Christina slowly blinked her eyes open. The morning light was streaming into the room and her head was pounding. She was struggling to make sense of where she was and how she got there. She fought past the pain and confusion and she started to assess her surroundings. As she took in the familiar walls and the room, she realized she was in her apartment, right where she was supposed to be, except something wasn't right. First of all, Christina only had fleeting memories of the night before at a bar that she'd gone to for just a couple of drinks. There was no memory of how she got back home. She knew there could be no way she'd gotten too drunk to remember, or had she somehow. Maybe she overdid it, blacked out, was so inebriated that she has no memory of how she managed to make it back to her apartment. But thankfully, she was safe. But as soon as Christina got out of bed, there was something else that caught her attention. As she stumbled through her apartment, sifting through her belongings to make sense of this strange morning, she realized that many of her things that had been inside of her apartment were missing. Her credit cards, her designer purses, jewelry, all gone. And that's when she realized she had been robbed. This triggered a more chilling thought. Had she been drugged to a point of unconsciousness by someone who intended to violate her space and steal some of her most prized possessions? What else could they have done to her? That was a frightening thought. At that very moment, Christina felt angry and fearful. She was terrified of being all alone in that apartment, which had once seemed to be a safe place where she was protected. There's no doubt that that feeling lingered for days until she found the courage to go out on the town again. She was determined that this one incident, as scary as it might have been, was not going to break her. Sadly, only four days after Christina woke up in this daze, realizing her home had been broken into, she was found dead in that very same apartment. Christina was living in Ardmore, which is a suburb in Philadelphia, a place that's steeped in history. Though it's not too far away from the city center, it has maintained its small town feel. It still has a vibrant nightlife, but it seems quieter and it's more sheltered from the big dangers of the city. The allure of being just close enough to the humdrum while still feeling safe and secure is what drew 36-year-old Christina Carlin Kraft and her fiance Alex to Ardmore. Before moving to the sleepy suburb, Christina's life had been anything but quaint and quiet. Christina was born and raised in New Jersey and had always dreamed of a life in front of the camera and flashing lights. While some girls dream of a corner office on Wall Street or a simple life with two kids, a loving husband, and a white picket fence, Christina daydreamed about her beautiful face being splashed across the cover of the biggest magazines in the world. And while it is true, the entertainment industry has destroyed the dreams and hopes of millions, Christina had what it took to make it big, and she knew it. She was incredibly beautiful. Her light blue eyes and cascades of dark brown hair drew people in, but she was more than that. There was a light behind those eyes that shined so brightly, people couldn't help but notice. She had star power, and soon this charisma would get her her dream job one step closer to the big lights. But let's go back to the beginning, before she really found success as a model. Christina Rose Carlin Kraft was born on November 11, 1981 in Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey, to Stuart Kraft and Dawn Ann Carlin. She had two younger brothers, Brian and Josh, and one younger sister, Kelsey. Brian was only two years younger than Christina, but tragically, their mother passed away in 1990 when Christina was nine and Brian was only seven. Eventually, Christina's father, Stuart, did go on to remarry a woman named Casey, and they had more children, Josh, who was 10 years younger than Christina, and finally Kelsey, 
who was 19 years younger than Christina was. Kelsey was actually born when Christina was graduating from Limwood High School in New Jersey, and afterwards she landed a job as a waitress on the Jersey Shore at Borgata Casino. Though this was a far cry from where she wanted to be, it wasn't a wasted experience. In mid-2003, $1 million was invested in the Borgata Casino to make it into a luxury resort, hoping it would draw in more tourists and stimulate the economy. Christina was still working there, and on Labor Day that year, she met a man who would go on to become the love of her life. He was a banker named Alex Shikatelli. It was love at first sight. Christina and Alex just hit it off and jumped headfirst into a relationship that would span the greater part of 14 years. This was not your typical boy meets girl, and they lived happily ever after romance. Christina had dreams, and she would stop at nothing to reach them, and luckily, Alex supported her aspirations, and soon enough, Christina's persistence started to pay off in her late teens. She landed a few modeling jobs with some of the biggest names in the world, Vanity Fair, Maxim, Victoria's Secret. She was doing it. And one of Christina's close friends was Eva. They met on a three-day photo shoot for Maxim magazine. Eva and Christina were chosen as the winners of a modeling contest, which featured girls from around the world. They became instant friends after the event. With the exposure from Christina and Eva's Maxim photo shoot, Christina's modeling career skyrocketed. The photo shoot gained a lot of attention, and Christina's reputation grew as a model. She was becoming a name in the industry. She started to become even more well-known and was getting booked for more high-profile jobs. She was living her dream. She had a loving man, a thriving career. What more could she ask for? Well, there was one thing, a job that Christina desperately wanted, but it had always eluded her. It was the one goal she just couldn't seem to reach. It was the pinnacle of a glamour model's career, a way to show the world that you had finally made it and you were someone to remember. Christina wanted to be featured in Playboy magazine. Now I know that life is not for everyone. And whenever I research cases and I get to know each person that I learn about, I put myself in their shoes. I try to understand and not pass judgment because it's really not my place. But to be fair, Playboy back then was an iconic brand, and it was special to Christina. Playboy Enterprises logo depicting the head of a rabbit wearing a tuxedo bow tie, I'm sure you've seen it, is still one of the most recognized trademarks in the world. The logo has been used since the 1950s, and many very successful actresses and models got their start by posing in Playboy magazine. Pamela Anderson, Anna Nicole Smith, Jennifer McCarthy, the list goes on. So Christina was determined to follow in their footsteps. The only problem is being offered an opportunity to pose for Playboy is not something that just happens very often. Sure, they were printing editions frequently, but the chances of getting a spread, let alone the centerfold, which is what women really want, that was basically slim to none. And I understand that while some people might think of Playboy as just a salacious organization that just promotes sex, to others, it was that quality that drew them to the organization. We can't forget the pop culture relevance that Playboy had in the early 2000s. And Playboy extended beyond just being a crumpled up magazine you'd find in your strange uncle's garage. It was a full-on operation with its own clubs, colognes, even apparel. And of course, in 2005, a hit reality show. It was released following the lives and times of Playboy founder Hugh Hefner and his three live-in girlfriends. Viewers got a rare glimpse into what it was like in this private and seemingly very glamorous life of the women who were dubbed Playboy Playmates or Bunnies. Viewers saw the Playboy Mansion, the extravagant parties that were held there to cater to the rich and famous. Playboy had a reputation as more than just a company. It was a lifestyle, one that held a certain allure that others might not fully understand. Christina was one of the thousands of women who sent their photos in praying for the chance to be given the golden ticket into the glitzy world of the Playboy organization. Competition for one of those spots is tough, and Christina would have been competing with countless other gorgeous women, all hoping that Playboy would choose them and propel them into the pages of legend. Despite the odds, that's exactly what happened to Christina. Just like she dreamed of, Playboy noticed that she had something special. 
that unidentifiable X factor. And in 2009, Christina got the call that she had been chosen as Cyber Girl of the Week. Now, the Cyber Girl of the Week was a model who was handpicked to appear on Playboy's online subscription platform at the time called the Cyber Club. A brief bio would be written about the woman and posted on the site alongside a boudoir photo shoot. On the 4th of May, 2009, Christina was given that opportunity. And granted, it was merely a stepping stone. It wasn't centerfold status. Christina was over the moon with gratefulness and excitement. Wearing a deep purple lace bra, the straps falling off her shoulders, Christina stared into the camera with her piercing blue eyes. Her full head of luscious brown locks tumbled down her back. And though she was wearing not much else, she's cloaked in confidence, and that adds to her allure. In this photo shoot, Christina looks every bit like a Playboy model that she's always dreamed of becoming. This shoot was a big deal for Christina. It gave her a ticket to the exclusive world of Playboy. Just like that, she was attending all the fancy Playboy parties, rubbing elbows with some of the biggest names in Hollywood. And one of the people that Christina met at these parties was the host. And technically her employer himself, Hugh Hefner, the founder of Playboy. She even posed in a picture with him at one of the events. I've personally visited the mansion for charity events several times, even swam in the grotto. It's famous, and I totally see the appeal for many, even though I didn't share Christina's exact dreams. And for her, attending these events was more about just the open bar and world-renowned DJs. It was also about getting some time with Hugh Hefner himself. After all, he was the man that would decide who was given that coveted title of Playboy Playmate. While Christina had posed for the online subscription platform and been invited to these parties, she was still considered to be on the lower end of the Playboy hierarchy. Becoming a Playboy Playmate meant that you were given the honor of appearing across the centerfold of the magazine, and only 12 girls a year were given this opportunity. And one girl gets the grand prize of becoming Playmate of the Year. Being a Playmate is about more than just a centerfold, a feature, and a title. It makes you an ambassador for the brand. And if you're really lucky, you might even catch Hef's eye and be chosen to be one of his girlfriends. So as you can imagine, for someone with these dreams, this competition, the position for a Playmate was fierce. And the selection process was more rigorous than it had been for picking the Cyber Girl of the Week. Christina had a real shot at becoming a Playmate. Her Cyber Girl photo shoot was stunning. She had the looks, she had the personality, there was just one thing standing in her way, her age. And at the time, she was only 26 years old. She's young by most people's standards, but that's considered downright ancient at Playboy. And in trying to stay away from having just blondes featured, they had picked way too many brunettes that year for the magazine. That's actually a thing. So with all those factors working against her, Christina discovered that she wasn't gonna get the gig. And just like that, her time at Playboy reached its end as quickly as it had started. It's so easy to become old news in that industry. The death of a dream might leave anyone feeling lost and uncertain about how to go forward. Christina may have felt cast adrift trying to find a new direction in her life, but it didn't take her long to find it. She had her sights set on being a model, and one rejection wasn't going to destroy those plans. Playboy was just one dream, but she had many more. So Christina set off for the modeling mecca, the Big Apple, New York City. Christina had hopes that perhaps there was something bigger and better than Playboy waiting for her in New York. She wanted to find a place where she could reinvent herself. So she gave it her best shot. Unfortunately, in the excitement of being chosen as one of the lucky Playboy girls of the week, Christina might have overlooked one fact. Not many other brands want to work with a model who once posed nude for a Playboy. It's just the harsh reality. And even now, Playboy has not been able to shake its public image of being pretty sleazy, some might even say cheap, which means brands and agencies can be reluctant to work with anyone who's been part of that world. As beautiful and vivacious as Christina was, she was not immune to the brutal reality of the modeling world. She put her heart and soul into finding modeling gigs in New York. She attended castings and auditions, and while she did get positive feedback about her looks, it was never enough. 
she never landed the job she wanted. And eventually, with nothing left for her in New York, Christina decided to move into a high-end apartment with her fiancé that he leased for them just outside of Philadelphia in Ardmore called The Square. It's in a cute neighborhood, and the building has an on-site gym, spacious rooms, and modern appliances, and it's far from living in New York City. But it's a really comfortable place to be. The town had everything you could need within walking distance, including a few pubs and cafes, and it's not too far from the city, so Christina was still able to go to castings if that was her goal. But of course, as a busy banker in New York, Alex felt like he didn't have as much time to be by his beloved fiance's side as much as he wanted to be, or maybe needed to be. Christina spent her days traveling across the city to go on castings, but at least Alex knew she was safe when she was home at their apartment. It was in a close-knit, more affluent community, but it is still well-documented that models, especially glamour models, often find themselves taken advantage by others, especially men. Men will buy into this fantasy that the model's there for their satisfaction, and they feel a sense of entitlement to be part of that fantasy. Alex thought that Christina would be safe in Ardmore and that they could build a beautiful life together, away from the grime of the big city. So when Alex left the Ardmore apartment on Tuesday the 21st of August in 2018, he might have felt comforted in knowing that Christina was safe tucked away in their little love nest. And that day when Alex left the Ardmore apartment to head to New York for an overnight trip, which was common for him, he called Christina. It was later in the evening and he wanted to talk about her day and wish her good night, but she didn't answer her phone. He wasn't immediately concerned because he thought maybe she was just out at a casting or around town. After all, the new area they were living in in Ardmore had a great bar and restaurant scene. And while it wasn't quite the same as the New York City nightlife, it will do. He also knew that Christina got quite lonely when he was away, so it wouldn't have surprised him if she'd gone out to socialize so she wasn't just all by herself in the apartment. But as the night turned into morning, Alex was still not able to get in touch with Christina. He called and called to no avail. And eventually morning turned into night again and a heavy weight settled in his stomach. He felt like something was wrong. His instincts told him so. Guided by that sense of worry, Alex left work, made his way back to the apartment, and he rushed inside to try to look for Christina. But the thing is, he couldn't get in their main front door. He could get into the building. He put his key inside of their doorknob, but it would just turn and turn, and the door wouldn't budge. No matter how much he wiggled the knob and pushed on the door, it remained firmly shut. He thought it must have been deadbolted from the inside. There was no way to get into the apartment, and with Christina still not answering his calls or texts, Alex called the police. It was Wednesday, August 22nd, 2018, a few minutes before 9 p.m., when Lower Marion Township Police Department received that call from Alex. He expressed concern for his fiance, Christina Carlin Craft. He requested a welfare check at their residence. He explained he could not get inside their apartment. When Detective Gavin Gashinsky received the news that a welfare check was required at an apartment in the affluent suburb of Admore, he wasn't too keen on rushing over there because residents in that neighborhood were notorious for calling the police for the littlest inconvenience. However, when he heard the exact address, he quickly changed his mind. He was familiar with a robbery that the police department had just investigated at the very same apartment just a few days earlier. Now, he had a call from someone who was worried enough to call in for a wellness check. Perhaps the thief had come back. Maybe the robbery escalated into something much more sinister. So he didn't waste any more time, and Gavin rushed over. When he arrived at the scene, he found a distressed Alex waiting outside. Alex briefly explained what was going on. He let them know that he was unable to get inside of his apartment or get a hold of his fiance and he'd come home early from New York on business to check on her. The detective agreed that the situation required action, so they band together. Using a crowbar, the police rammed their way into the apartment. Something I've always wondered is whether detectives consider what they might find on the other side of a locked door before going in. I wonder if they prepare themselves for a positive outcome or guard themselves in case it's negative, but probably both. But either way, in this instance, opening that door was like opening Pandora's box. From the second they crossed the threshold, they were immersed in a crime scene as gruesome and bloody as they come. 
surely being face to face with death, especially death that had come with such horrendous violence, was something that no one would be able to prepare themselves for. It's not what they wanted to find or what a loved one expects to see. Detectives waded through the chaos of the living room area and made their way to the bedroom. And that is where they found the worst of it. At the center of overturned furniture, clothes just thrown around the room, there was pools of blood and a bed sheet on the floor. Detectives moved towards the sheet and they already knew what they would find. As they gently lifted the corner, they saw Christina. She was lying on the floor lifeless, completely still, and not moving, and her beautiful face had been beaten beyond recognition. It was a gruesome picture of cuts and bruises. Her hair and head were covered in blood, and rigor mortis had already set in. Her eyes, those stunning blue eyes that had once captivated an audience of adoring fans, were now dark and glazed over between two broken eye sockets. Her delicate nose had not been spared in the brutal attack. It had been crushed into her face. It was clear from the extent of Christina's wounds that whoever did this had been driven by an intense rage. But who? Why would anyone want to hurt Christina and want her dead? This fun, vivacious girl with a soul that was perhaps the most beautiful thing about her was dead. In cases like these, the number one suspect, and you know this, is almost always the significant other of the victim. That meant that the police had a potential suspect waiting at the door of the apartment. When detectives made their way back to Alex and let him know what they found, he was anxiously pacing the hallway. And when he got the news that Christina was dead, he doubled over in shock. He was desperate for answers, but perhaps this was all a performance. After all, if you are a true crime consumer or a web sleuth, if you will, then you'll know that guilty spouses can put on some award-winning performances when they want to, or at least they think they are sometimes. Cue Chris Watts on his front porch performance, for example. Perhaps Alex was better than most at feigning heartache. So naturally, given all the circumstances, detectives brought him into the station for questioning. After several hours, it was clear that Alex had nothing to do with Christina's murder. He was a really heartbroken fiance, and this was no act. With their first and most important suspect ruled out, police turned to their second potential perpetrator, the person who was responsible for the robbing of Christina only days prior to the murder. That's right. Christina had been the one that was robbed recently. I told you that detectives and police officers had been at that exact same address. Ardmore is not the type of suburb that anyone has things to worry about like this. They don't happen too frequently. It's a very low crime area, so police figured that incident that happened was probably a one-off because lightning doesn't usually strike the same place twice, right? Well, they're not sure now. Recall that is exactly what made the detective change his mind about wanting to rush to the scene. This address was familiar. He had just taken a report a few days ago. I explained in the beginning of this video that Christina woke up one morning on Sunday the 18th feeling as though she had been drugged. She was completely dazed, and once she adjusted to where she was, she realized that her precious belongings were gone from her apartment. So she filed a police report. At the time of her murder, the police were still investigating the robbery and had combed through security footage, which they thought could lead to their thief. I want to make an important point here. I just read statistics that said 70% of individuals between the ages of 18 and 24 years old have reported having their drinks spiked or have witnessed someone else's drink being spiked with a substance while out on the town. And 87% of victims do not report this incident to the police. And I have to admit, it has happened to me. When I first got here to Los Angeles, and it happened so fast. I'm gonna leave some very helpful links below to products that you can buy that will keep your drink safe when you're out because it's sad and it's scary. So please take a look, maybe share it with a friend, because if you like going out, having drinks, but don't want to risk experiencing a terrifying event like that, it could be very useful for you. But let's go back to what happened to Christina. While taking her police report, they had her retrace her steps from the night of the burglary. And detectives had deduced that she'd taken a rideshare to a bar in Center City, Philadelphia on Friday, August 17th. Christina couldn't tell them what happened next. However, 
After reviewing security footage, the investigators determined that Christina rode back home with a man who fit the description of the rideshare driver that she used that night when returning to her apartment at 3 a.m. And this was just the Saturday before her murder. He was a black male that appeared to be in his early 30s with facial hair. He had a slight mustache and closely trimmed beard, and he was driving a burgundy Kia Sorento with Virginia license plates. On the CCTV footage, detectives are able to see a man get out of the vehicle while Christina is seen passed out in the backseat of the car. The driver takes Christina's keys off of her body in the front of the backseat and enters Christina's apartment building in the early morning hours without her, just leaving her behind in the car. The man went up to her apartment alone and spent more than an hour in there before coming back out and leaving the building carrying a heavy box around 4 a.m. The man came back a second time a few minutes later. However, this time, he woke up Christina and he is holding her as they enter the building. Then the footage captures a very dazed-looking Christina propped up against him as he leads her to the elevators and into her apartment and then leaves her on the floor as he's bringing more boxes of what they believe are Christina's items to his car. Afterward, the man leaves but returns to the elevator, and once the elevator doors close, the man exits the building and drives away. Police released the still images from the CCTV footage, hoping that someone would recognize this man who broke into Christina's apartment. When detectives working on Christina's murder case are questioning the officers who took her initial report about the burglary, they remembered her because she was so upset. She told the officers during the robbery report that she felt isolated and unsafe and how badly this incident impacted her. While they were working on finding out who that man is, they gather more information about who their victim is. And based on Christina's online activity, they could see she was very active on social media and had a large online presence. She definitely left behind a digital footprint that spanned at least the last several years or more. So investigators combed the internet and found an article about Christina in the New York Times from back in 2016. It was reported in the news that Christina had gone into a dispute with a Manhattan restaurant manager over the amount of her bar tab while she was out partying one night with a friend at the Smith. And this was in March of that year. The argument escalated to the point that the police were called because Christina allegedly struck the man in the neck and then kicked him in the groin. When police arrived, Christina explained the manager had pushed her, but the video footage showed that wasn't true and that Christina was very intoxicated. She was arrested and charged with misdemeanor assault. Well, this is interesting to the detectives because they know she was out the night that she comes home with this unknown man that appeared to burglarize her apartment. So, of course, their interest is piqued. After the detectives brought Christina's 2016 arrest to Alex, he explained that they went to court and they made a deal with the prosecutor to drop all the charges against Christina if she agreed to stay out of trouble for six months. Christina then relocated to Philadelphia the year after the incident. Alex wanted to protect Christina and he felt like she was safer in Ardmore than she would be in the city because if she needed anything while he was working in New York, he could contact his parents who live nearby in Philadelphia. But while Christina's life in Ardmore was going okay, she missed the hustle and bustle of the city. Although Christina lived in a beautiful community, she struggled to adjust to the suburban lifestyle. Christina had grown accustomed to the city's convenience and energy, and the quiet suburban lifestyle just couldn't compare. She found there were fewer things to do and fewer people to meet in the suburbs, so adjusting was hard. And even though she lived a distance away, she would frequently still party in the city. And then, of course, the detective stumbled upon Christina's Playboy debut as a cyber girl. And it didn't take long for the media to latch on to that aspect of this case. Her murder became nationwide news with an emphasis on her history with Playboy. That made for eye-catching headlines, even though it is true. It's also a small fraction of her life. And we know there was so much more to who she was. But it's still a fact. And it was also something she had always been proud of. It's too bad it had to be memorialized for such a morbid reason now. But detectives found Christina's Model Mayhem account as well. That was a popular site back in the day 
where models could showcase their work and attempt to connect with brands. Think of it like LinkedIn for modeling. In her About Me section, she wrote that she's 5'9", 125 pounds with dark brown hair and an olive complexion with green eyes. She wrote that she was from Russian and German descent with a hint of Swedish, and she's interested in fashion, editorial, print, glamour, advertisements, lingerie, swim, commercials, movies, etc. She also mentioned doing runway shows, print work, commercials for jewelry, and evening gowns. And in her words, she did a, quote, tasteful photo shoot for Playboy that was beyond Hollywood glamour, end quote. Maybe she was trying to downplay it at the time, making sure it was known that she at least landed the gig and she was recognized by such a big brand, but not really going into the details of what she actually was chosen for. But days before Christina was found lifeless in her bedroom, the investigators were trying to piece together who this unknown man was who robbed her. Some investigators were examining Christina's credit card statements, while others analyzed CCTV footage. While investigating Christina's credit card usage, the investigators noticed that someone had used her cards at convenience stores nearby on the night they were stolen. It was confirmed that the man who used Christina's credit cards was the same one they saw break into her apartment after viewing the store's CCTV footage. Thankfully, the police were able to identify this man. And that was because he had previous arrests. His name was Andre Melton. He had a previous arrest record and was considered dangerous. Knowing that Andre had a violent streak, police quickly obtained a search warrant for his home and an arrest warrant for him for burglary. On the morning of Wednesday the 22nd of August, just hours before Christina was found, police had actually gone over to Andre's home to execute that search warrant. Unfortunately, while they did find thousands of dollars of items that had been stolen from Christina's apartment, including designer bags, jewelry, keys, even the title to a BMW, there was no sign of Andre himself. But they knew that Andre knew exactly where Christina lived and how to get into her apartment. Had he gone back to try to get more things, and maybe he was concerned about leaving a witness behind that could identify him. Either way, police needed to find Andre. There was now an added urgency to the robbery investigation because we're talking about murder now. Meanwhile, Christina's autopsy report comes back from medical examiner Kayla Wardak. It turned out Christina had 22 bones broken in her face with significant bruising, but her cause of death was determined to be from ligature strangulation. Someone had put something around Christina's neck, and of course the manner of death was ruled a homicide. I cannot imagine someone doing that to someone. She was hit over and over again. It's unbelievable. So now, while hunting down this thief, detectives continue to scour through hours and hours of surveillance footage because they have a violent person that they need to catch. They searched frame by frame of footage until they found something. It was Christina leaving her apartment in the early morning hours on the day she was found dead. Christina left the building alone, but a little while later, around 3 a.m., there she is again. But this time, she's not alone. She's walking arm in arm with an unknown man. The man has the same complexion as Andre. He's a black male around the same age, maybe in his 30s. He's wearing a white do-rag, a leather jacket, and white jeans. But it actually doesn't appear to be Andre. This man and Christina walk into the apartment building a little while after 3 in the morning, around 3.08 a.m. Christina's door opens, and the security system recorded that time. But then no other doors are detected being open on Christina's security system until 5.19 a.m. when the system recorded that the door to the balcony closed. Christina's apartment is considered a first floor apartment, but if you look closely, the first floor appears to begin on what would normally be considered the second story of the building. The investigators believed the perpetrator could have escaped by jumping over her balcony. It's not that far of a drop. And this is because neither one of them are seen leaving or walking back out the front door. Whatever happened after they entered that apartment building will leave one person dead and the other the subject of a nationwide manhunt. Thankfully, the security footage of Christina and this mysterious man was incredibly detailed. It was of high quality. And in a lot of cases like these, the footage is so grainy and distorted 
that it fails to fulfill its intended purpose, but not this time. The footage was very clear, thanks to high-tech CCTV being installed in this newer building. Officials had detailed snapshots to send out to the media in hopes that someone somewhere would know something. They also distributed footage of Andre, hoping that someone might be able to pinpoint where he might be hiding out. At this point, police had no way of knowing whether Andre and this other man were somehow connected. Maybe they had conspired to rob Christina again, and things took a turn for the worst. At this point, even more news stations were talking about the Playboy model that had been murdered in her fancy apartment. It's just the type of salacious story that's made for headline gold. So news companies kept running with it, while the media circus systematically dehumanized Christina and reduced her to just a Playboy model. It did have one positive effect. It helped the police garner more useful information. On the 23rd of August, just one day after the murder, a detective working on the case received a phone call. It was Andre Melton himself. It seemed like Andre had seen his picture circulating in connection with a gruesome homicide, and he said he wanted to set the record straight. He told detectives that yes, he robbed Christina on the morning of the 18th of August, but he had nothing to do with her murder and he wasn't gonna go down for something he didn't do. He wasn't gonna hand himself over to a police as requested because he didn't wanna be charged with her murder. I don't know if Andre genuinely thought the police was just gonna take his word for it and stop going after him, but it's actually the opposite of what happened. Officers did not let up on searching for him. They continued to investigate the identity of the other man as well that had been caught on surveillance. They suspected that Andre could have given Christina's address to a friend and set her up for another robbery. But soon enough, the publicity that this case was getting paid off. Everyone was talking about this horrible murder. And when people talk, even when it's gossip, there's often some truth to be found in between the lines. So police received a tip from a key witness. The man was an Uber driver who claimed that he had driven Christina and the man on the CCTV footage back to her apartment that night. The driver said, then when Christina and the man entered his car, neither one of them looked distressed or under duress. To the contrary, in his mind, they looked to him like lovers on a date. They were affectionate and happy. The driver said that Christina actually flagged him down instead of using the app and begged him to please let them inside, even though you're really supposed to use the app so it can keep track of everything. Christina told the driver she needed to ride home because there were people on the street harassing her. She promised to give the driver cash when they returned to her apartment. So he let them into his car in city center and drove them all the way back to Ardmore, which is about a 40 minute drive. However, when it was time to pay, Christina told the driver she didn't have cash on her. She tried to hand her American Express card over to the driver, but he explained because she didn't use the app, he did not have a way to receive payment with a card. Eventually, the man she was riding with offered to give the driver $100 if he waited outside the apartment for 15 minutes or so while he went inside to get some money and make sure Christina got in safe. The man even promised that when he came out, he would give the driver $100 as a tip and still give him the rest of the money. It was not a good situation to be in, and the driver knew he could be getting swindled, but he didn't feel like he had much of a choice. So they even exchanged numbers, and then he waited outside of the apartment and waited and waited and waited. And as the minutes went by, this man had still not come back out. So after close to 30 minutes had gone by, and the man did not return to the car after walking Christine inside, the driver eventually cut his losses and drove away. Now, as helpful as the statement was, it still left police without one key piece of information, the identity of the man that Christina was with. Police wouldn't have to wait long before they received another call, though, that would put them one step closer to finding out who this mystery man really was. On October 26, they receive a call from someone who claims to have been roommates with the man in the photos that was splashed all over the news. Except when I say roommates, this wasn't your typical roommate situation. The person said they had recently shared a room with this man in a psychiatric facility in Philadelphia, and this was just a few days ago. The mystery man had landed himself in the psychiatric ward after harassing a woman in Philadelphia. He allegedly kicked her while he was in Center City Family Court, 
and he was sanctioned to a 72-hour psychiatric hold. As the caller recounted everything he knew about this person, he told the detectives about a disturbing conversation they had. The caller said that the man had gleefully told him how he strangled a woman to death and that there was, quote, nothing like squeezing somebody and feeling the last breath leave their body, end quote. He said it was the best feeling in the world. Wow. So clearly, whoever this guy was, he needed to be stopped before some other unsuspecting person fell victim to his sordid plans. The caller had spent time in this regulated institution with this man, so there had to be a record of his identity, right? It was actually a shock when they discovered that the man had been admitted to the ward under John Doe. No legal name was given. And worse yet, he had already been discharged by the time the police got there. They missed this person that was heavily suspected as Christina's killer by just a few days, perhaps even hours. At this point to detectives, this case might have started to feel like an extended game of cat and mouse. They were just chasing their tails. For days, they had poured over everything they had in this investigation. They were working late hours, just getting enough sleep to keep themselves somewhat functional and still, they didn't have that vital piece of information. And Christina's family was a mess. They were desperate for answers while they were also trying to paint Christina in a way better light than the media had. Her loved ones wanted the public to know Christina was more than just a Playboy model. Her aunt, Angelique Carlin, said, quote, she was the sweetest girl, loving, kind, generous, and thoughtful. Those are the things I will miss about her. She also, of course, wanted to know how this happened and why. And it's true. We don't know Christina. And the media will latch on to the bad or the most interesting facts about someone. That they like to party, they pose nude, like to get into brawls at bars. But if we were to have a magnifying glass put to each of our lives, there's bound to be something we're not proud of that doesn't define an entire person. Her father told the Daily Mail that Christina was, quote, a happy-go-lucky lady. She loved life, she loved to be around people, and she liked to enjoy herself with people. And that's what I think occurred. I think that someone saw her happiness and took advantage of that, end quote. But at this point, the investigation looked like it was going to stall. However, on the 29th of August, just one week after Christina was found, they got their break. This was ironically the very same day as Christina's funeral. The 36-year-old was brought back to New Jersey and her service was held at Venter Church. Her father, Stuart, greeted mourners outside the church after the service. And Christina's body was carried by pallbearers in a white casket and placed in a hearse adorned with flowers. She was later buried at Laurel Memorial Park in Egg Harbor Township, Atlantic County, New Jersey. And like I said, that same day, the police received a call from someone who claimed to be a family member of the man on the CCTV footage. They thought this had to be it. They were finally going to be able to catch their man. Well, yes and no. The family member had the man's name, but the police would have to figure out how to catch him on their own. He was identified as 31-year-old Jonathan Wesley Harris, a person who had a felony record and had been released from prison on robbery and drug charges just five weeks before Christina's murder. Now that the police had a name, they knew it was just a matter of time before they found Jonathan and finally were able to put all the pieces of this puzzle together. With nothing else to go on but some old-school detective work, the investigators started to unravel the mystery of where Jonathan could be. They called friends, acquaintances, family members, anyone who might know anything and was brave enough to come forward. And eventually, police spoke to Jonathan's sister. And it was after speaking to her that they got their answer. She told detectives that Jonathan had left Philadelphia. In fact, he was on a bus headed straight to Pittsburgh. With this information and no more time to lose, detectives contacted authorities in Pittsburgh and let them know a potential killer was headed to their city. He was violent and dangerous and needed to be apprehended as soon as possible. Using Jonathan Harris's photo and his criminal history, Pittsburgh officers formed a fugitive task force to better understand and prepare themselves for what they were up against. And despite having a significant criminal record, Jonathan Harris was never charged with anything like murder. 
He was, of course, convicted of things like forcible entry and drug trafficking. Pittsburgh task force members made their way to the bus station to try to intercept him. The authorities had an approximate time for when the bus would arrive. Now they just had to wait. They had surrounded the bus station and blocked all the exits to make sure there was no escape for their suspect. And eventually they heard the rumble of the bus as it made its way into the station. And authorities watched as the bus slowed to a stop and the doors opened and out walked the very first passenger. It was not their guy. Following closely behind the first was another, but again, not the man they were looking for. But finally, a man stepped out of the bus and as soon as the light hit his face, authorities knew that was the person they were searching for. He was the third person to step onto that platform and police jumped into action and ordered Jonathan to place his hands against the wall. And for a brief moment, it looked like he might make a run for it. But in the end, he was arrested and taken into custody. Now, detectives had the who. They were reasonably certain that Jonathan had killed Christina. They had the where because they finally had Jonathan in custody, but they needed the why. How did Jonathan and Christina know each other in the first place? They seemed to be having a great night together until they entered her apartment. So what happened in those few short hours that could possibly end up with Christina dead and Jonathan on the run? When they showed him a picture of Christina and asked how he knew her, he claimed he'd seen Christina while out on the town and decided to strike up a conversation. They discussed how lonely she was in the suburbs and how she missed the party atmosphere that the city offered. The two of them hit it off, and they were both under the influence of drugs and alcohol, according to him. So they decided to head back to Christina's apartment to keep the party going after the bars began to close. Jonathan said he'd been providing Christina with party favors that night in the form of as much cocaine as she wanted, with her allegedly promising to pay him for it once they got to her place. But once inside, Jonathan claimed they drank a couple bottles of wine, used some more cocaine, and then had consensual sex. However, according to Jonathan, remember, there had been some sort of agreement that Christina would pay for the drugs that she used that night. He said once their rendezvous was over, Jonathan said Christina refused to pay the $1,200 worth of drugs. At first, a verbal argument ensued where Christina allegedly told Jonathan that it was his decision to give her the drugs and she wasn't going to pay for it after the fact. And she had hid his cocaine. He didn't know where it was. But when Jonathan didn't agree to those terms, he said the argument escalated and Christina picked up a wine bottle and smashed it against his head and his ear started bleeding while she kept screaming for him to get out. Now, after this happened, he claimed they did get physical with one another, but he did not kill her. He said he slapped her in the face and she fell to the floor in the hallway of her apartment and he left. According to him, when he left her apartment, she was still alive, just very intoxicated. Well, this story does seem plausible. There are just a few things wrong with it. First, Christina did not have any drugs in her system when she was found. Her toxicology report only found alcohol in her body. Secondly, if he did not kill her, then who had done so on the exact same night they fought? Detectives let Jonathan know they weren't buying his account of the story. They got up from the table, they left the room, thinking that maybe if he just had a few minutes to gather his thoughts, he might be inspired to tell them the truth. One can only imagine the overwhelming emotions and thoughts that are flooding through a person's mind in a moment like this. There he was, in a cold, dark room, having to deal with the fact that he might spend the rest of his life in a cold, dark room not too dissimilar to the one he was currently in. He must have known the gig was up. He'd been through this before. It wasn't his first rodeo. He had hidden, ran, lied, and it had all been futile because there he was, there was nothing for him to do but tell the truth. Those few minutes alone on his own most certainly stirred up something in him because when the investigators came back, Jonathan told a story that was a bit closer to what might have actually been the truth. He admitted that he and Christina had a physical altercation over drug money. He claimed they used $1,200 worth of his cocaine, which he expected her to pay for. But she thought, in his mind, she thought having sex with him was enough. And he said he slapped her in the face and she fell to the floor. 
Then he said he picked her up, walked her into the bedroom, and put her on the bed. At that point, he said he was panicking. She was naked and he had white pants on. I'm guessing he's saying he did not want to get blood on himself. And then he said she was trying to recover from the blow he delivered to her. When she recovered, she began to scream at the top of her lungs. So what did he do? He punched her in the face and begged her to be quiet. He told her he punched her in the face and begged her to be quiet. He said he told her he didn't want to hurt her. But then when he punched her, she got quiet and she kind of went unconscious. And as she was laying on the bed, he tied her hands up with a pair of pajama pants. He tied her to the bed so she couldn't hit him back. He said at that point she was acting pretty reasonable and he told her he was just scared and wanted to leave. He did eventually untie her, but he explained that he thought she was cooperating, but she was pretending. She jumped off the bed and tried to run to the front door, so he grabbed her and threw her back on the bed and then started beating her in the face over and over again, this time hitting her harder with the intention of making her unconscious. She finally did pass out, and then he went looking for his cocaine, which he said he found inside a jewelry box. When asked what Christina was doing at that point, he said she was on the bed, bleeding profusely, and he was now looking for money, but didn't find any, and he was panicking because she was breathing funny. His words, she was on the bed, breathing funny. These are all his words. He said he didn't know if he should just burn the house down or what, but he turned her over on her stomach and blood was coming out of her mouth and she actually allegedly spoke to him, saying, I'm fine, I just wanna call my father. Jonathan obliged, he went to go get her phone from the living room and handed it over to her, but Christina wasn't calling her dad. She was trying to call for help. She was in fear for her life, and she managed to punch in one number, the number nine. Jonathan said he panicked when he saw that she was trying to call the police, so he snatched the phone away from her before she could press one, one. He took the phone and threw it, and that's when he says in his panicked state of mind, he began choking her and pushing her on the bed, and when he let go of her, he swears he still saw her breathing but she wasn't fighting anymore. Then he covered her body with a sheet because he didn't want to look at what he had done. Then he stole some of her clothes, presumably to change into them because his were blood soaked. And then he made his exit. Jonathan was never seen exiting the apartment because he said he took a different route altogether. Christina's apartment was on that second story. And around 5 a.m., the sliding door was open and Jonathan jumped out and ran away just as investigators had suspected. As brutal as this crime was, Jonathan maintained that it was never his intention to hurt Christina. He said, quote, I panicked. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. I covered her with a blanket because I didn't want to see her like that. I knew she was hurt really bad, end quote. Jonathan also claimed that he was under the influence of some pretty heavy drugs that night, which were responsible for altering his behavior. He admitted to killing Christina, but pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder, saying that this was in no way premeditated. At trial, Jonathan and his attorneys did not deny that he had choked Christina to death. Their entire defense was that Jonathan did not go into that apartment that night with the intention to murder Christina, and thus, a first-degree murder charge was too harsh. They asked the jury to find him guilty of third-degree murder instead, which carried a much lighter prison sentence. And sure, this argument seems to make sense until you think about the fact that number one, Jonathan bragged about the feeling of choking the life out of someone when he met that roommate at the psychiatric facility. And of course, there's the fact that he could have run away. And he didn't come forward even when the story broke in the news. At any point, he could have told the police what happened, but he chose to try to get away with it. He didn't have to kill Christina at all. He could have left her tied up or even just fled after he punched her the first time or pushed her. But he went many steps further by beating her and choking her to death. Christina fought for her life until the end. Jonathan could have stopped the attack. There was ample time for him to cool down, come to his senses, and make a different choice. A choice that wouldn't have stolen a young woman's life and left her family in a state of sadness and distress. 
the jury must have had the same sentiments because they found him guilty of first-degree murder, as well as kidnapping, possession of an instrument of a crime, and strangulation. Reporters watched from the gallery as Jonathan processed this verdict. In the end, when it came time for Jonathan to reveal what he thought about the verdict, he simply said, quote, justice was served, end quote. And I think he's right. When it was time for Christina's fiance to give his victim impact statement, Alex addressed Jonathan, calling him a coward, and said, quote, you killed a kind, loving, generous, amazing person who is sorely missed by everyone every day. You destroyed the lives of so many people and inflicted needless pain on our family and your family. And for what? End quote. Alex went on to talk about how Christina's murder has devastated her family. He said the fact that Jonathan lied about Christina doing cocaine or even wanting to buy drugs from him and just drag her name through the mud was hurtful. She had no drugs in her system. Alex said Christina had never once used cocaine as long as he knew her, and we know that he knew her over 14 years. Jonathan received an automatic sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. He also received an additional 22 and a half to 45 years for other charges. And as for Andre, you know, Christina's burglar, he was eventually caught in December of 2018 and arrested on unrelated charges, but later found guilty of burglary, receiving stolen property, theft by unlawful taking, and criminal trespassing. Christina's family reiterated that she was more than just a model. She was kind, and she had warmth that drew people to her. She never left her side without telling you she loved you, and she loved animals. She also loved her dad, so much so that in her final moments, he was the one she thought of calling. In Stewart's victim impact statement, Christina's dad, he described her as, quote, the brightest light that ever lived. And even though her life may have been cut short, that light lives on in the hearts of the countless people who loved her, end quote. I am personally so sorry to Christina's family and her loved ones. And my hope and message to all of you is to please be careful. I know that life can be dull and it can be lonely at times and we want a taste of adventure and fun, but please always go out with someone else and use the buddy system, not leaving anyone behind. We just saw what could happen with the Riley Strain case. A fun vacation with tons of friends turns deadly if they decide to stay out and not accompany someone home. Look out for others because you never know what can happen. When we're drinking, we are in a way more vulnerable state of mind, especially when we're all alone. Thank you so much for being here for Christina's story. I will see you in my next video. Bye.